Hello, my name is Jürgen Knoblich. I am a scientist at the Institute of Molecular Biotechnology of the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna. And in this second part of my lecture, I would like to tell you about how we can recapitulate human brain development in the lab, starting from pluripotent stem cells using three-dimensional culture methods. Now, I'm sure every one of you would agree with me that the human brain is the most complex, but also the most fascinating structure that nature has generated. It contains about 87 billion neurons that have to be born at the right time, migrate to the right position, and wire up in the right way in order to allow us to perform the cognitive processes that we're able to do. Now, despite its complexity, the brain develops from a limited number of stem and progenitor cells in a set of predefined rules. And essentially, everything that we know about those rules comes from experiments that were done in rodent model systems, particularly in the mouse. So this shows you a very simplified view of mouse cortical development. The mouse neocortex develops from a neural epithelium that lines a liquid-filled cavity, which is called the lateral ventricle. It's a polarized epithelium with basal to the outside, apical to the inside, and all the different cell types in this epithelium are nicely arranged in a layer-type fashion along the apical basal axis of the epithelium. So here, on the more basal side, is the so-called cortical plate, and this is where the neurons are and where they send out their axons. And here, on the more basal side, is the so-called ventricular zone, and this is where the stem and progenitor cells reside. And these progenitor cells undergo either one of three different types of division. Early, during development, they divide symmetrically, and this leads to an initial amplification of the progenitor pool. Later, they divide asymmetrically, where one progenitor generates one progenitor cell and one cell that migrates out to become a neuron, or the other cell forms a so-called intermediate progenitor, which divides once more into two terminally differentiating neurons. And this is called direct or indirect neurogenesis. Now, when we move from rodents to humans, there is two characteristic differences. First of all, the initial set of symmetric divisions lasts a lot longer in humans and in primates. This is a rodent cortex and a, a rodent brain and a primate brain at about at a comparable stage of development, magnified to a comparable size. And what you can see is that while the more posterior brain parts are actually very similar, the cortex is vastly expanded in the primate brain. And this is because these cells had a lot more time to divide symmetrically and to amplify. The second big difference is that in addition to the ventricular zone and the cortical plate, the primate brain contains an additional layer that is called the outer subventricular zone. The outer subventricular zone is characteristic for primate brains, and it contains a cell type that is called outer radial glia cell or basal radial glia cells. These cells are not or in only very small numbers present in rodent brains. But in primates, they act as a transit amplifying population during neurogenesis. So while in the rodents, per progenitor division, either one neuron or two neurons are generated. In the primates, the progenitors generate these outer radial glia cells, which continue to divide asymmetrically, generating hundreds of intermediate progenitors and hundreds of neurons. So this is good news because it explains why we have so many more neurons than a mouse, but it's also bad news because it means that there are certain brain developmental processes that cannot be modeled in a rodent model system. And this is particularly emphasized on this slide. This shows you an MRI scan of a patient who suffers from a very severe neurodevelopmental disorder that is called microcephaly. What you can see is that the patient's brain is much smaller than that of a healthy patient. This patient carries a mutation in a gene that is called NDE1. NDE1 is conserved all the way uh, uh, through evolution from yeast to humans. But when you make a mutation in a mouse NDE1, you see no or only a very weak phenotype. So certain neurodevelopmental disorders cannot properly be modeled in rodent 
models. And for this reason, there have been many attempts to actually model brain development in a human setting. So how can we actually do this? The easiest way, of course, is to use human tissue. Human cortical tissue can be obtained from aborted fetuses. Uh, it can be fixed, it can be stained. Uh, there, one can even do life imaging and uh, uh, cell tracing uh, on this. But of course, such experiments um, place a huge experimental burden and ethical burden um, and are very complicated and usually suffer from low N numbers. And for this reason, people have been trying to model brain development starting from pluripotent stem cells. The easiest way of doing this is to turn the pluripotent stem cells into neural stem cells, which can then uh, be forced to undergo neuronal differentiation. And one can study uh, the phenotype in those um, patient-derived neurons. But of course, neurons like to be in a three-dimensional environment, and so there's many limitations to those two-dimensional experiments. And so there have been many attempts to actually model the development of human tissues in three-dimensional culture. And really the pioneer of this has been a Japanese scientist uh, named Yoshiki Sasai. Yoshiki Sasai, uh, 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 around 2012, um, was able to recapitulate the development of a human eye uh, in culture. And this was clearly uh, a pioneering experiment uh, in the field of generating human tissues um, in culture. Now, I think Yoshiki Sasai clearly was one of the leading developmental biologists uh, of our times, and it's very sad that he's no longer um, with us. And so based on his work, but also adding uh, other experimental approaches to it. Madeleine Lancaster, uh, a couple of years ago in my lab, has decided to, um, to develop an uh, in vitro three-dimensional culture system that we can use to model the development of a human cortex um, in culture. And here's the method that she came up with. We start with pluripotent human stem cells, which we dissociate and then rapidly re-aggregate on the bottom of a 96 well plate. We then allow those cells to develop into embryoid bodies, giving them just enough time to form the three germ layers. We then replace the medium with a neural induction medium so that only the neuroectoderm survives. And these balls of neuroectoderm are then placed into droplets of matrigel, which is a collagenous three-dimensional support matrix that supports the development um, of uh, uh, stem cell-derived tissue. We then culture these matrigel droplets, first in floating culture, and later either in a spinning bioreactor or, more recently, in an orbital shaker. And over time, Madeleine saw the development of fairly complex tissues. So these are two examples of what we call cerebral organoids. Here is one example, you can see a developing human cortex here. Here is a lateral ventricle. Here is another piece of cortical tissue. And here um, is another one. This is another example. Um, there's cortical tissue here and over here. And down here, you see the development of a human eye. This is a cross-section through a cerebral organoid. There's cortical tissue here. You see a ventricular zone here. Here is the lateral ventricle, uh, and here are the differentiating neurons. Um, down here is what we call the choroid plexus, which is the area that generates the cerebrospinal fluid. And here are other brain areas. In the absence of uh, markers, I do not know what they are, but I want you to note that they have a different um, histology indicating that they are different areas of the developing human brain. So cerebral organoids can be used to model the development of various parts of the human brain. But for our analysis, we focused on uh, the developing cortex, which is the most complex, but also the most fascinating part um, of our brain, and also the one that is most different between us and uh, rodents. This is a cross-section through a cerebral organoid. Uh, this is the cortical uh, uh, part. In red are progenitors, in green are uh, differentiating neurons. And what you can see is that at this stage, the organoid histology is essentially indistinguishable from that of a developing mouse cortex. So cerebral organoid can recapitulate the three-dimensional organization of a developing human cortex. We also analyzed 
um, neuronal differentiation. The neurons in the cerebral organoids send out long axons that contain growth cones. They often branch out. They can bundle together. And the neurons also send out large dendritic trees. But most importantly, the neurons in our organoids are electrically active. This is a calcium imaging experiment where you can see that the neurons uh, spike action potentials and they communicate with each other and the pattern uh, of these uh, uh, electrical firings is far from uh, random uh, and, and, and there are certain correlated uh, neurons and anti-correlated neurons. So cerebral organoids recapitulate both the three-dimensional organization of the developing human cortex and proper neuronal differentiation and function. Now, the neurons in the developing cortex actually come in different flavors. Uh, they are arranged in a layer type fashion and these layers are formed in an inside out manner where the deep layers are formed first and then newly formed neurons have to migrate through these deep layers, adding additional layers to the outside. There are various markers for these layers. SATP2 is a layer for the out, is a marker for the outside, neuron CTIP2 for the inside. When we stain early organoids, essentially all of the neurons are positive for the deep layer marker CTIP2. A bit later, SATP2 positive neurons appear. Initially, they are intermingled, and then they show some kind of uh, sorting out, although we do not really see the uh, formation of proper. Uh, neuronal layers. But the temporal specification of various different neuronal subtypes can be recapitulated in the cerebral organoids. So we've generated a three-dimensional culture system that we can use to recapitulate the development of the human cortex in culture. So what can we do with it? In my view, we are currently experiencing a complete revolution in the way of how we do biomedical research. And this is because there are currently four technological developments that are coming together. The first one is the availability of more and more complete human genome sequences, many of them associated with complete patient records. The second one is our ability to generate pluripotent stem cells from each of these patients. Uh, and the third one is our ability to generate in the lab more and more different tissues as organoids that recapitulate particular organs in those patients. And finally, we can edit the genome and introduce or remove mutations from any of these pluripotent stem cells. And how we can combine these technologies to analyze human neurodevelopmental disorders will be shown on the next couple of slides. For this, we teamed up with Andrew Jackson, a pediatrician neurologist at the University of Edinburgh, who works with a patient who suffers from a severe form of microcephaly. This is an MRI scan of the patient. You can see the brain is much smaller than that of an age-matched um, healthy patient. We obtained a biopsy from the patient, reprogrammed the cells into iPS cells, and then generated organoids from them. These are healthy control organoids and patient-derived organoids. And what you can see is that the control organoids contain uh, a, a, a nice differentiated ventricular zone, large ventricles, and many neurons. But the patient-derived organoids are much smaller. They contain a lower number of neurons and only a very tiny ventricular zone. So using our organoid system and patient-derived iPS cells, we can recapitulate the small brain phenotype of a microcephaly patient. And we can now go back in history and ask why are there so fewer neurons in these microcephaly-derived um, organoids. This is a control organoid and a patient-derived organoid at a much earlier stage of development. At this early stage, in the control organoid, all the progenitor cells are still undergoing the symmetric divisions and neurogenesis has not started. This is very different than a patient-derived organoids where we can already see the appearance of individual neurons. And we conclude from this experiment and many others that I don't have the time to show you that the cells have switched to an asymmetric division pattern in a premature state. This leads initially to the formation of too many neurons at a too early stage, but at the same time, the progenitors are not sufficiently amplified, and we believe that this is the reason for why those organoids are so much smaller. So premature neurogenesis and incomplete progenitor amplification are correlated with the appearance of a microcephaly phenotype. So how can we explain this? 
For this, we performed whole exome sequencing on the patient, and we found that the patient carries a compound heterozygous mutation in a gene that is called CDK5 RAP2. Both of these mutations introduce premature stop codons, and consistent with this, we do not detect the CDK5 RAP2 protein in the patient derived cells. So what is CDK5 RAP2? CDK5 RAP2 is a protein that originally has been identified in the fruit fly Drosophila, where it was called centrosomin. It's a centrosomal protein that is absolutely required for the correct orientation of the mitotic spindle. And consistent with this, while in the control organoids, at an early stage, all the mitotic spindles are precisely aligned with the ventricular surface, in the patient-derived organoids, they assume a more or less random orientation. And so we believe that during the early stages of cortical development, the orientation of the mitotic spindle is very important to ensure the equal distribution of the apical and basolateral plasma membrane domains and to make sure that both daughter cells can maintain the progenitor fate. Um, in the patient-derived organoids, however, a tilt of the mitotic spindle no longer allows the symmetric inheritance so that some cells start undergoing neuronal differentiation and only a few maintain the progenitor status. So a defect in spindle orientation leading to a lineage defect uh, might be responsible for the microcephaly um, phenotype. So this is where a normal human genetics analysis would stop. We've recapitulated the disease. We've found a plausible uh, gene and a plausible mechanism. But now genome editing tools allow us to unambiguously ask, was it really this mutation that was responsible for the disease phenotype? And for this, we use genome editing to repair one of the two premature stop codons. This is a control organoid, a patient-derived organoid, and an organoid that's derived from cells where we have repaired one of the two uh, mutations. And what you can see is that both the size defect as well as the premature neuronal differentiation can be um, rescued. So cerebral organoids can be used to recapitulate neurodevelopmental disorders, and they can also be used to unambiguously associate particular mutations with uh, those disorders. Now, microcephaly is a very severe disorder, and ultimately, we would like to uh, recapitulate more subtle disorders like epilepsy or um, autism. And the holy grail of neurodevelopmental disease modeling is a type of neurons that have a very complicated uh, developmental origin, and these are the GABAergic interneurons. This is a schematic view of the developing cortex. Uh, the cortex develops from the dorsal neural epithelium, and all the neurons that um, arise in the dorsal uh, neural epithelium uh, express an excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate and become excitatory neurons. In addition to those neurons, there are inhibitory GABAergic interneurons which arise from the ventral part of the developing cortex. They then migrate tangentially to go into the dorsal areas and integrate into the circuits of the dorsal cortex. And it is thought that migrating interneurons is what actually um, uh, is absolutely essential for creating functional neuronal circuits. And uh, the types of mutations that are associated with diseases like epilepsy or um, autism suggest that defects in interneuron formation and migration may be associated with many of these diseases. And so we asked, can we actually model this very complex developmental event in our cerebral organoids. First thing we wanted to know is, do we actually have ventral and dorsal cortex in the um, organoids? This is shown here. The dorsal cortex can be identified because the neurons on the intermediate progenitors express a gene that is called TBR2, whereas the ventral cortex, the lateral ganglionic eminence in this case, can be identified by the expression of GSX2. When we section an organoid, we find Typically, that the organoids contain both TBR2-positive dorsal regions and GSX2-positive ventral regions. So both ventral and dorsal areas are actually present in our cerebral organoids. So can we use them to model interneuron migration? 
This slide shows you a dorsal cortical area where the intermediate progenitors express the dorsal marker TBR2. And when we stain the adjacent section with um, um, a VGAT, an interneuron marker, and somatostatin, a marker of particular interneuron subtypes, we find that interneurons are actually present in the dorsal cortical um, areas of the um, organoid. So, Interneuron migration from the ventral into the dorsal part can actually be modeled in cerebral organoids. But there's one key problem with this, and this is illustrated here. In the current protocol, organoids are a little bit like a car where the wheels are up, the engine is up, the seat is in the back, the windshield is in the front. So all the individual parts are present, but they are in a random arrangement. And so if we make a section through such an organoid, we have to be very lucky to hit both a dorsal and a ventral part and to be able to um, uh, uh, model interneuron migration. And so we asked, can we actually introduce a polarity axis in organoids, for example, a dorsal ventral axis? And so in order to do this, Josh Bagley, a postdoc in my lab, set out to develop a protocol where he separately generates dorsal organoids and ventral organoids. And then he places these two organoids together into one droplet of matrigel. One organoid is labeled with RFP expression. Another organoid is labeled with GXP, TFP expression. Initially, when the two organoids are co-embedded, they lie next to each other. But over time, they fuse with each other. And if I would not show you the red and green color, you would not be able to distinguish the boundary between the two organoids. So we have developed a co-culture protocol that we can use to generate organoids where one part is dorsal and the other part is ventral. So can we use this to model interneuron migration? This slide shows you a typical dorsal-ventral fusion organoid. And what you can see is that within the dorsal area, you see these green uh, spots. When we focus in on this, we find that these green areas are actually full of cells that have the migratory appearance of um, interneurons. When we fuse dorsal with dorsal organoids, we no longer see this. And so from this experiment and many others that I don't have the time to show you, we conclude that when we fuse ventral with dorsal organoids, there are cells that are migrating from the ventral into the dorsal part of the organoid. So what are those cells? This slide actually summarizes a very large number of experiments, and I only show you the key experiments. Um, here I show you that the migratory cells express GFP, and all of them also express GAD1, which is a marker for um, developing interneurons. This is a high magnification view, and you can actually see the elaborate cell shapes that these develop these migrating interneurons actually have. We also used many other markers of migrating interneurons and various interneuron um, subtypes uh, like parvalbumin, somatostatin, neuropeptide Y, um, and also calbindin and calretinin. And we find all of these subtypes in our migrating um, uh, fused organoids. So taken together, this tells us that we can use fused organoids where we have regenerated a dorsal ventral axis to model the long range interactions of various parts of the human brain, in particular, the migration of cells from one part of the brain into the other. Now, of course, ideally, we would like to image this process of interneuron migration in real time. And in order to do so, Josh developed a method that we can use to do long-term imaging of migrating interneurons, and this is shown here. For this, Josh makes very thick slices from fused organoids, and those slice, slices are then imaged on a spinning disk time-lapse microscope for about uh, three days. This is a still of one of these um, migratory uh, movies, and what you can see is that we can actually see migrating cells that go from one part of the organoid into the other. This slide shows you a movie of a migrating uh, interneuron. The interneuron can be seen here. Here is the cell body, and here are two processes. I would like you to focus uh, on this one cell, and you will see that it migrates across the entire field um, of the movie. 
And uh, interneuron migration is one of the most complex, but in my view, also most beautiful processes that occur um, during uh, development. You can see the cell extends many processes, then some of them are retracted, and it migrates along other um, processes. The second movie shows you a more realistic view. Uh, this shows you how crowded the field is. There's many different migrating interneurons. I want you to focus on uh, this one, and uh, you will be able to see that this cell actually migrates across the entire field of the um, uh, image field. So here you can see that the cell uh, extends different processes. Some of the processes are then retracted. Uh, it makes decisions to actually follow processes which initially are um, weaker. Um, and so with this, we can now use organoids to model long-range interneuron migration, and we're in the process of deriving iPS cells from patients that actually suffer from neurodevelopmental disorders to see whether interneuron migration is affected. Now, it is known that the migration of um, interneurons is in response to a chemokine um, that is called CX, uh, CL12. And uh, the receptor for this, chemo, uh, for this uh, uh, chemokine is CXCR4. And uh, there is a drug called uh, AMT3100 or Plerixa4, which actually is an inhibitor of this uh, chemokine receptor. And so we asked, is interneuron migration that we actually see in our cultures dependent on this receptor? This is a normal organoid where you can see a lot of interneurons migrating from one into the other part. And this is an organoid that has been cultured in the presence of the CXCR4 inhibitor. <clears throat> and what you can see is that the migration of the interneurons is actually almost completely suppressed. I want you to note that the growth of axons from one part of the organoid into the other is actually not affected, indicating that the other part of the organoid is actually still alive. <clears throat> So we can use fused organoids to model interneuron migration and also to test chemical compounds for their effect on interneuron migration. And we're currently generating various models for uh, neurodevelopmental disorders uh, that uh, we can use to uh, then test whether interneuron migration is um, affected. So in the end, I would like to summarize what I've told you. <clears throat> I've told you that we have generated a three-dimensional culture system that we can use to recapitulate early human brain development in culture. Our cerebral organoids generate various parts of the um, human brain that can actually functionally um, interact with each other. We can use the organoids to model neurodevelopmental disorders, and we can generate various parts of the human brain separately in culture, then fuse them together and the interactions between these various parts are maintained. And uh, particularly the last part of this, of course, has huge potential. We will be able to generate any pairs of uh, uh, um, um, brain regions and uh, watch the migration of cells from one into the other or the migration of axons and hopefully eventually even be able to visualize the formation of some of the major um, axon tracts. In the end, I would like to acknowledge people who actually contributed to this work. The hero of the organoids is Madeleine Lancaster. Uh, she was a postdoc in my lab, now has her own lab at the uh, LMB in uh, Cambridge for looking at dorsal ventral patterning. She worked together with a grad student, uh, Magdalena Renner. The fusion organoid system was generated by Josh Bagley, another postdoc uh, in my lab. Uh, these are the names of other people who uh, worked together in these various projects. Um, the reprogramming of the cells was a collaboration with the lab of uh, Joseph Penninger. I would particularly like to thank the patient and their family for, allows, for allowing us to um, uh, use the, the, the cells uh, in our experiments. And our uh, collaborator at the University of Edinburgh is uh, Andrew Jackson. I would like to thank the Austrian Academy of Sciences uh, for funding our work. Uh, in addition, we obtained funding from the European Re Research Council, the Austrian Science Fund, and from uh, EMBO. And I would like to thank my entire lab uh, for being such a fantastic group. <laughs>